So uh, late 2009, I joined a team and moved over from another role at Netflix to join a team called Electronic Delivery. And I stepped into a little bit of controversy uh, when I did that. A decision had just been recently made that was an architectural and organizational decision. And uh, some people had some strong reactions to it. And I, I heard about that pretty quickly when I took on this role. But let me set the stage for you just a little bit. In 2007, Netflix had launched on one device. It was the most popular and most ubiquitous device at the time, which was Windows, uh, and launched on Windows Media Player. And fortunately, within a short period of time, we were able to expand that to the Silverlight platform, which actually allowed us to add Mac support. It made all of our engineering friends very happy. Uh, Netflix had also launched on the Roku player, which was the first set-top box that did Netflix streaming. And scored a deal with Microsoft, we were able to get Netflix uh, onto the Xbox 360, which had a large installed base, had a great, uh, great sort of network stack and capabilities. Um, and so we were able to really leverage that platform quite a bit. Netflix also was expanding, doing sort of turnkey implementations of an SDK, of an SDK uh, in uh, various CE devices like Samsung and LG Blu-ray players, DTVs, uh, and also a variety of other C CE manufacturers. The user interface was primitive, and that primitive user interface involved going to the website, adding a movie to your instant queue, coming back, and watching a movie. It was a very, very bare bones implementation that was bolted onto the Netflix DVD infrastructure and experience. You can see the foundation here in the early versions of the website where play buttons started getting scattered throughout, add to instant queue buttons. You can see very much how this was sort of an add on and actually from a business perspective, it was as well. As well. Uh, initially, there was no charge for streaming and then there was a nominal charge uh, by the time we rolled around to 2009, 2010. And the infrastructure was also very simple and very primitive. Uh, it was HTTP based. There was an application stack that had user interface components, uh, security, activation, playback capabilities, and an underlying platform called NRDP, which was the Netflix Ready Device Platform. And it talked over HTTPS using a, a protocol, an XML RPC style protocol. And everything about this implementation was very sort of custom and crafted, like a custom ticket-based authentication system, custom response codes, and everything that was designed within this took sort of a lengthy process to design each of these for every version of the protocol that was going to be rolled out. And then it was plugged into a simple hardware-based load balancer in the Netflix data center. We were still in the data center at that time, uh, and had one application, the Netflix Content Control Protocol Service, or NCCP, which then had its own database and plugged into the Netflix legacy infrastructure. What was also happening was there was this massive amount of work coming because streaming was the future of Netflix as a business and there was a growing demand for more and more engineering to grow that part of the business. And so we very much had this feeling like a steamroller was coming to run us over. At the same time, there was a, a, a service called the Netflix API that had originally been developed to drive our DVD business. Uh, the idea was to let a thousand flowers bloom, which meant we would have a lot of web applications built around uh, an API that provided content metadata so that people could build interesting apps, which hopefully would drive traffic back to the Netflix service. But it didn't really turn out that way. It didn't really turn out to be very successful. The API was also um, built in a very similar way. There was a web app connecting over HTTPS, but you'll see that the technical stack was actually a little bit more modern. It was REST-based. It used JSON for its schema. It used HTTP response codes, which were a bit more standard or becoming standard at the time. And because of the nature of the app, it was using OAuth as its security mechanism. And a proposal was made by the leader of the Netflix API team that we go ahead and add API into the mix. There was a team that was ready to, to do some new work. The API itself and the Thousand Flowers effort really wasn't going anywhere, so this team was sort of ready to dig in and take on a new challenge. Uh, and it seemed like an interesting idea to explore. And so the idea here would be that the UI experience, the discovery experience, would be supported by the Netflix API, and it would plug in. And then the playback security and platform functionality, all the rest of the functionality would continue to be supported by NCCP.
And if you look at the assessment from a sort of a dispassionate perspective, there were some pros and there were some cons to this approach. One was separation of concerns. We could have a whole separate team focused just on the discovery experience. More bandwidth because there was a team that was available to jump in and help out. And the thought was that this would drive faster innovation, which Netflix is always hungry to do. But on the con side, the reliability, the, the API platform was not incredibly reliable. It hadn't been designed for scale. Uh, fetching metadata for these apps was not sort of a massive hit on that. And so there were a lot of concerns about the stability of the API platform and whether or not it could hold up and be more like the utility application that NCCP had become. The other concern was that there was a heter heterogeneous architecture, differences in protocols and security mechanisms and work styles. And finally, concerns were expressed about the lack of domain knowledge of the API team taking on the streaming space, which, was, which is a very deep space. The security aspects alone were fairly deep. And so this turned into a little bit of a cage match uh, between the two teams, neither one really wanting to give their side. The electronic delivery team wanted to hold on to the user interface experience and thought that one service tier was the right path. And the API team thought the opposite, that they could provide more value to the business by partitioning that off. And at the end of the day, it took our chief product officer, Neil Hunt, to play referee and make sort of a top-down decision to decide which path are we going to go down. And we ultimately decided to go down the split path. Any thoughts on what the reaction was after that, or, at, or how many people want to show of hands that think that the uh, electronic delivery team was happy with this decision? Anybody think they were happy with it? Oh, one or two people. OK, you're an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> this was the reaction, pretty much. Um, there was concern, a lot of concern about the future of the product experience, the impact on our members, the reliability, all of those things. There was also some anger about the way that this happened. It felt like a land grab to some of the people involved. Uh, I would say that really what it comes down to when I think about what's underneath all of this, and I've seen this happen even amongst the best leaders and the best engineers, there's a form of tribalism that is at play. The idea that our team can do this really well, but we don't know about those other teams. We don't know if they're going to do as good a job as we are. And very commonly, when you ask teams about each other, they always think that they do stuff really well. The other teams, maybe not so much. Uh, and this is, I think, fairly universal. And the problem with this tribalism is that it creates walls. And this literally, this experience and this tribalism and the way that this all unfolded created a hard wall between the NCCP-based team, the electronic delivery team, and the API team. And that wall persisted even for several years after I came in and took on the electronic delivery team, despite my best efforts. So this is an example. This gets to the heart of Conway's law. And uh, would somebody mind raising their hand and sharing with us what Conway's law is? And it's fairly well known. Uh, anybody want to volunteer? I saw a part of a hand go up. Here we go. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> Can you shout out? There you go. It's that relationship between organization and architecture. And typically, you're, it, it implies that your architecture is a reflection of your organizational structure and communication mechanisms. But this is my favorite description of it, and it really hits home here. If you have four teams working on a compiler, you will end up with a four-pass compiler. And this is, this is really true. Uh, this really does happen in the real world. And this is why there are walls. These, this is an example where those walls come up between each of those teams, where the architecture is driven by the organizational structure, rather than a solution being determined first and then allowing those organizations to contribute. And so my premise for today is that Conway's law describes dysfunction. And I think we sometimes just talk about it as a fact of life. But I think I'm going to take a stronger stance on this and say this is, it should not be this way, that you actually end up with suboptimal solutions if you follow Conway's law. We have to embrace an architecture first approach. Architecture must come first before organization. And not only that, technical 
analogs and technical perspectives will ultimately help you drive better organizational solutions. They can take some of the emotion out of the situation, some of those fears and concerns and all of those things that we were just talking about. But if you take nothing else away from this talk today, I wanna to encourage this thought, this thinking, this philosophy of selfless leadership. I'm sure all of, you play, all of you play a leadership role in your organizations. And selfish leadership helps you get to the best possible solutions. And what that means is that when you're making a decision about architecture or about organization, you think about the company first, then you think about your team, and then you think about yourself. You're still important, but if you're really trying to do the best thing for your company, then you wanna go and do these things in that order. So for today's, today's program, I'm gonna do a little bit of introduction. I haven't yet introduced myself, and I'll do that in just a moment. I wanna spend a few minutes just talking about a framework around refactoring that we'll use throughout the presentation. And then I'm gonna go deep into my experience managing the electronic delivery team and the scaling challenges that I, that I had to work through and some of the, the outcomes that came from that. And I wanna spend a few minutes acknowledging the fact that if, even if we do take these technical perspectives and apply that to organizational problems, that people are not computers. And there are times when you have to factor that in, even if you try to take a detached perspective most of the time. And then I'm gonna come back full circle to this story that I just started with, and I'll get another bite at the apple to sort of take a look at Conway's Law and potentially have an interesting reaction to that. So by way of introduction, my name is Josh Evans. I was at Netflix for about 17 years. Uh, I just left recently. In 99, I started with the DVD business, first as an engineer, then as a manager. I was able to help foster the DVD e-commerce uh, experience over to streaming. And then in 2009, I moved over to manage what was the electronic delivery team, but I really didn't like the name. Uh, and we ended up renaming the team to streaming infrastructure. So I'll use that throughout the rest of this talk. And this is essentially all of the infrastructure that enables playback, not the actual streaming of bits, but all the surrounding functionality, whether that's digital rights management, manifest delivery for URLs so that you can go fetch content from a CDN, device activation, all of those things. And then in 2013, I moved on to run a team called Operations Engineering. And the philosophy of this team is that all of your operations, wherever possible, should not only be automated, but engineered, and infrastructure should be built to make it work as well as possible. And not only for your customer-facing member experience and the production environment, but also the environment where your engineers are working every day. So you can think of this as sort of a, an analog to the DevOps SRE space. And now I'm taking some time off. Uh, it's kind of thinking about next steps. For those of you who would like to tweet as we go, I've put my, my Twitter handle up there. Feel free. Now the reason Netflix is relevant here and I think all of you know this, is because Netflix is very successful. It's a very successful business, and so there might be patterns here that would be useful. Netflix is a global leader in subscription internet TV with a growing slate of original content. A lot of it is globally licensed. There are 100 million members strong now. That just happened recently. In 190 countries, localized in tens of languages, on thousands of device types. And what all of you probably know, like Netflix was an early adopter of the cloud and AWS and microservices. And they also have a very unique company culture, which is highly relevant to what we're talking about here. Let's dig in and talk about the framework a little bit. So who can tell me at a fairly high level, why do we refactor? Why do we refactor code? What are we trying to accomplish? Any volunteers? Say it louder. More efficient code. More efficient code. Anything, anybody else? Just yell it out. Make things better. Make things better. Okay. Remove redundancy. Remove redundancy. That's a good one too. Elegance. Elegance. That's, an, that's a controversial one there, but I, I won't touch that one for now. <laughs> uh, so make things better. We refactor to improve or sustain something. Typically it's functionality. Uh, sometimes it's engineering velocity. You want to make things better. I want my make, make my code more uh, maintainable, make it easier to make changes without having to worry about breaking things in 10 places. Uh, and then also functional and operational quality. 
So uh, that would mean either quality from a traditional QA perspective or performance, reliability, those key metrics we care about for our service architectures. And these things tend to happen when we scale. As you add more functionality, as you get more traffic, you're gonna find breaking points that encourage you to go refactor because now things aren't working so well. So you've lost it. Now you're just trying to get back to where you were before, or you may be trying to make an improvement. And so scale is critical here. And there's two dimensions of scalability that I think are relevant for this conversation. One is functional scalability, which is essentially the ability to add features easily with minimal effort. The other is what most people think about when you talk about scalability, which is load scalability, the ease with which you can add resources or remove resources as your load shifts around. And I'm gonna propose a couple of uh, quick definitions for what I would call organizational scalability. This is the ability for an organization to easily add people and domain responsibilities in response to increased work and complexity, but also the ease with which an organization or team can, adopt, can adapt to shifts in business strategy. Can you be nimble? Can you quickly move over and do something that you didn't anticipate? And in terms of when we refactor, it usually feels something like this when you hit this, tip, this tipping point. Things just get harder. You feel like you're pushing a rock uphill. And more specifically, common tasks become difficult and strategic efforts become impractical or impossible. In terms of how we refactor, we typically apply patterns whether they come from object-oriented design, talking about inheritance or polymorphism or composition. In microservice architecture, patterns like uh, auto-scaling or horizontal scaling. Or systems engineering, concepts like, I don't know, parallel processing might come to mind. And let me give you a quick example of how natural it is to think about a technical perspective and apply it back to an organization. I think we do this in the engineering world fairly fluidly. Uh, and here's a great example. The Netflix culture deck has one slide that sort of captures the essence of what Netflix culture is about. With the right people, instead of a culture of process adherence, we have a culture of creativity and self-discipline, freedom and responsibility. And freedom and responsibility is so ubiquitous in the vocabulary of Netflix that it gets contracted down to F and R, man. That's how they refer to it. You wanna do that, you wanna go do this thing? Sounds a little crazy, but F and R. And as Netflix moved from a monolithic data center model to microservices in AWS, they also adopted the philosophy espoused by Werner Vogels. You build it, you run it. And you build it, you run it, you could think of as a concrete implementation of the abstraction of freedom and responsibility. That's how natural this is. Because in the engineering world, that's exactly what it is. You are go, you're free to go build a great service tier. You're free to make code changes at 12 o'clock at night on a Friday. But you should be on call and have to deal with the consequences of your actions. That's the freedom part, and that's the responsibility part. So as you can see, this is really very natural. You can think of inheritance in all kinds of ways and how that might apply from a culture perspective. So now I wanna dig in and talk about scaling teams. And I'm gonna take you back to 2009 when I did take on this team called Electronic Delivery. And we were still in the early days. We had these devices in production plus many more smaller ones. And we had to support all of those. So obviously once something goes into production, it becomes that one more thing you have to keep up and running. And we had some key platform development in, prog in progress. And key platforms are these custom bespoke applications that Netflix builds in-house, as opposed to providing an SDK to a CE manufacturer who's gonna do the integration themselves. And when I first started, there were two projects in the works uh, that were still being developed and getting prepared for launch. One was called Vega. It was the disk-based PS3 implementation, the very first implementation for that device. And the other was kind of a strange project. This was uh, called, this, this platform here is for the Sony Bravia systems. It was called Bivol. And it was their own sort of proprietary framework. And we had decided that the, the strategic relationship with Sony was so important that we ended up doing this very custom implementation to make that happen. And it was a lot of work, 
couple of engineers were working on each of these in parallel. And then no more than about a week or two into my tenure running this team, a gentleman named Anthony Park, who is still at Netflix, he was at the time director of Keep Platforms. He came to me and said, hey, we've got this project and we want to start enabling subtitles and alternate audio as a feature uh, for streaming. And I thought it sounded like a really cool feature. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Let me go find an engineer. I found one. I said, OK, you can have this guy, uh, Ben, and he'll come work with you. Well, no more than two days later, a gentleman named John Funge came to me. He was running the Link project. That was the code name for the disk-based Wii implementation. And he said, hey, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but the second you're done with these other launches, we're in line. And we expect to get resources so we can launch this within a few months. So it was a very tight schedule and an immediate turnaround on that. Oh, and by the way, I think there's a lot more stuff on your plate than you're realizing. So big picture, what I came to realize, and I realized what I had taken on, was that there were many parallel tracks of work that I needed to be able to accommodate. Netflix wanted to be on every possible device that they could get their hands on that made sense. Product innovation was going to continue as normal. Netflix does that in a relentless pace. By the way, we were going to roll out in Canada in 2010, so get ready for internationalization, because that's going to take some effort. Oh, and cloud migration at the same time. You know, We'd already decided in 2009 that we were going to move to the cloud, so we also had to do that. And as I mentioned earlier, service reliability. We've, we've got a service running. People expect it to work. Uh, and reliability was a bit of a challenge for us in the early days. Uh, so we had all of these things that we needed to be able to do. So I suddenly had a moment of panic. <laughs> how many engineers do you think I might have had? Just guess how many engineers were supposed to support all of this. Just throw out a number. We're in the, we're in the order of magnitude here. That's good. Six. I inherited six really good engineers, but there were only six of them. So this was me that day. I went home I with, yeah, obviously not me. <laughs> this person has more hair than I do, but that's the way I felt. I went home and had a bit of a meltdown. I was like, I got this new job. I got these new people I'm working with. I'm lying on the floor. My wife is talking me down. I'm like, OK. I think I can deal with this. But I indulged for you know about an hour. I was like, oh, shit, what am I going to do? What would you do in this situation? What's the first thing that you would do? Um, rather than raising hands, just shout it out. OK, maybe one at a time. <laughs> Say it again. Anybody else? Prioritize, good. Anything else? Delegate to other people. It's kind of hard when you've got six people and they're all totally loaded. Ah, interesting. Hire more. Good, good, good. You got the gist of it. Let me tell you what I actually did. So going back to our sort of uh, computer science perspective, I'm going to start with the analogy of a task queue. So we had all this work. We had to prioritize it. So let's get it in the right order. Let's dump it into a thread pool, which happened to be the six engineers that I had. And then we get our completed tasks. And so we did this prioritization exercise. Uh, service availability always at the top of the list. You got to keep the things running you're already responsible for. And then really all we could take on, and I wasn't even sure that we could do all of this, was to continue to focus on these device launches. New game consoles, new versions of the apps for those game consoles. We were going to go downloadable. CE expansion, so getting onto more and more of those LG and Samsung devices. Oh, and mobile hadn't even really kicked in yet, but we knew something was coming. You know, the, I, the iPhone had been out for a little bit. We kind of knew mobile was going to be a growing space. And what we couldn't get to was pretty much everything else. Audio and subtitles, international support, new codecs that we want to do to make things more efficient, and the list would go on and on. So clearly, the next thing I needed to do, which one of you already shouted out, was I needed to scale up my team. I needed more people. I had great engineers, but there's only so much you can do with six engineers. And so the first thing we needed to do is figure out, well, what's the profile of the work that we're doing? What are the roles that we need, and how much do we need of those kinds of roles? How much throughput do we need it to be able to provide? What, would, what team structure would support that? And I had what I would call a monolithic team. And I think for any of you that have been at a startup, this is essentially the way teams start. 
uh, they start monolithic. There's usually a manager, maybe there's no manager you know, in a startup scenario, and a relatively flat organization where work sort of happens ad hoc and the next project comes along and whoever's available goes and jumps in and, and starts working on it, which is great when you're small, but not when you need to scale. And so just as in the monolithic world and from an architecture perspective, you have to decompose your organization just like you would decompose a monolith, monolithic architecture. And typically what you're doing is figuring out what are the distinct modules and services you might break your monolith into? How do you partition the work? Because typically your challenge with a monolith is it isn't scaling. You have to figure out how to split it out. Can you do it horizontally? Can you break out different kinds of workloads into different apps? You have to be aware of your dependencies and what are you going to break? What do you want to continue to support? And you ideally want everything to be sort of loosely coupled so your, your services can function independently and be maintained independently so you can be more agile. And so we did that. We took a first stab and broke the, uh, what I now call streaming infrastructure. Didn't really like the electronic delivery name. Uh, and so we ended up renaming the team to streaming infrastructure, which made sense at the time. And we broke it into two worlds, one focused on the CE manufacturers, the core SDK, which was called NRDP, the Netflix Ready Device Platform. That's general protocol design, all of the sort of uh, basic platform functionality that you would want for streaming. And then those features would get ported into what we called our key platforms. Those were all those bespoke custom applications that Netflix was building in-house. And it was generally device and partner oriented, so we were able to think about our dependencies. The key platform engineering leads were different from the people we worked with for the more generalized features. So that worked out you know, reasonably well. But this is really just the beginning. We were still missing some pieces to the puzzle. And the next piece came in as I was starting to understand what the operational load looked like. And we had some problems uh, with overload. There was a vicious cycle that was happening where we had one engineer who was really good at doing a lot of different things. This gentleman is Philip Fisher Ogden. Some of you might know him. He actually has my, my old job uh, right now. And Philip was great at a lot of things. He was great at development. He under deeply understood the features and the infrastructure involved in supporting the streaming. He had built out this great thing called Server in a Box that allowed us to easily test the streaming uh, functionality. He was a good project manager. And I was sort of thinking like, hey, if I need a manager, this guy might be really good at it. But the fly in the ointment was he was really good at troubleshooting because he knew how everything worked and he had a natural talent for discovering what was broken. And we wanted Philip to do this work, right? Because you build it, you run it, right? So he built NCCP. He was one of the main engineers on there. So we did want him to be on call. It made sense for him to do that. Uh, but the problem was is that he was overloaded. There was a high risk of burnout. He was already trying to find strategies to try and offload some of his work or make sure he at least didn't get called on the weekend by putting some dashboards together and checking things on Friday. Uh, and he was making very slow progress on his other things because anytime somebody couldn't figure out what was going on in production, he was the guy that got called. And we had some stability issues in the early days in the data centers, so that happened often enough that it was pretty distracting. From a systems perspective, this is a classic scenario of, what I, of thread starvation, if we want to use that as an analogy, where you've got a queue of tasks, but some of those tasks are super expensive or very, very uh, frequent. And they happen so often, and they consume so much of a shared resource. Imagine a lock, a global lock of some kind, that the other work simply wasn't getting time and wasn't moving forward. And Philip was our shared exclusive resource in this case. Now this is only part of the problem because the other part of the problem was context switching. And in context switching from a systems perspective, you typically have one thread executing, you'll get interrupted for whatever reason, and then you have to go save out your state. You go idle, and then the other process has to go fetch state to go bootstrap itself, and then it can start executing. And then the whole process reverses back and forth each time you switch context. Now we know at the systems level, this can create gross inefficiency, but for humans, it's even worse. Because if you've ever worked on a project where it's very, very complex, it can sometimes take you 20 minutes to half an hour just to get your mind into the right state of mind to start writing code. And if just as you're starting to get into that, you get interrupted, you're not really gonna be able to make very much progress. And so both of these uh, challenges were at play here. 
And the solution here is thread pool isolation and distributing your locks and distributing that high interrupt expensive work and spreading it across your thread pools so that it is not as much of an overall percentage for each one of those pools and doesn't dominate the workloads as much. And so we essentially did the same thing at the organizational level. We deepened the troubleshooting skills across the team and built some dashboards and tooling to make it possible for people to be more self-sufficient when they're on call. We distributed the escalation so that we didn't just have Philip responding whenever people couldn't figure out what was going on. And we also came to realize that we needed to engineer our operations because the burden on everybody doing on call was just too high. We needed to make it easier to do those kinds of things. And so we added one more component to the organizational structure, which was a team at the time called Insight and Tools, but you can think of it as an early precursor to the sort of DevOps function as we think about it, or what I like to call operations engineering because I think it's a more descriptive term. And so we had that component now added to uh, the set of things. This was a huge amount of work and we realized we really needed to invest. Now then there's that pesky thing of cloud migration. Um, cloud migration is really distracting and it really, it, it changes a lot of things that make it difficult to do both cloud migration and product work at the same time, especially if you have the same people working on both of those things or the same organization. And the difference is that the workloads actually are very different. So when you're doing cloud migration, it's this sort of systematic endpoint by endpoint, service by service migration from one place to another it requires a lot of sort of methodical work. It's very inf infrastructure intensive and a lot of that work happens over a period of time. And yet product work is really about rapid iteration. It's about A-B testing, it's about trying out new things, it's about adding incremental functionality all the time. And these two workloads are so radically different that it was essentially impossible for the electronic delivery team at the time, this was just before I joined, uh, it was impossible for them to do both, plus the throughput issues which we've already discussed. So another analogy, and this one is from microservice architecture, is a pattern uh, around heter how to handle heterogeneous workloads. Imagine you've got member traffic coming in and it needs to hit some service within your middle tier infrastructure. And first you're gonna hit a cache. If you get a cache miss, you'll go hit the, the service that supports that cache, which might fetch data from a database, and then backfill the cache so that you can go and, and have that available so you get a nice fast read from the cache on the next hit. Imagine you also have batch processes that need to access that very same data. And it's hitting the cache, it's falling back to the same service, but then it can take it down because batch services are very different workloads. They're very spiky. They can come in and just hammer the crap out of your service if you're not careful. And God forbid that happens at the same time that you're taking peak traffic from your members. And so once batch, can, batch comes in and takes out your caching tier, it'll take everything else out because falling back to your service and your database, those aren't gonna perform nearly as well as your cache. So it'll overwhelm all of them. And before you know it, everything's down. Batch isn't working, member traffic isn't working, you're dead in the water at that point. And so the classic approach to handling this is to partition your workloads. So in this case, uh, for this service in, service in question, the cache layer was replicated and there was a dedicated cache just for batch. Now you could go and say if that, if that fails, then go ahead and stop calling or you could decide to, I like to think of it as a zipper, you can go all the way down the stack and really create totally separate copies if you really need to. And so that's what we did to get cloud migration started. We partitioned and we chose Silverlight as the first platform to be migrated to the cloud to do a prototype on that and essentially figure out, okay, let's just get one thing done. And the partitioning was easy. We did have another team, somebody called that out before, that could take on some of the work. Um, that was our platform engineering team. The problem was is they didn't know anything about streaming. They were building generalized infrastructure. And so part of the solution also involved domain portability. How do you get the intelligence, the knowledge, the algorithms that are known in one space and move it over? And we essentially took one of the leads the one for somebody who'd been running the team prior to me and a gentleman named Ranjit Maven Curve, and he moved over right into the platform team and embedded in that team. 
and he took all the knowledge and expertise that he had about streaming and brought it into that team. So this is a team that was great at building infrastructure, that was ready to build generalized infrastructure for cloud migration for all of Netflix services, and Ranjit was there to help them figure out how to make that first step. Now, the other thing that was really cool about this was that Ranjit came back to streaming infrastructure after he was done. And he took all that knowledge about the infrastructure and the platform work, that generalized work about how to get something stood up in the cloud, how to build a service in the cloud, and he brought that back to the team. So I like to think of this pattern as engineer as a library, uh, sort of following that metaphor of using a computer science metaphor here. And so the last piece here was to add a systems function into the team. And that initially was cloud migration. Other things sort of rolled in afterwards. The next problem was staffing. We needed to get from about six people to somewhere around 24, 25, and that was my first guess. Uh, ultimately, it ended up being more than that. And I became the bottleneck. It was only one of me, and I'm pretty good at recruiting, but um, you can only, one person can only recruit so many people so quickly. And so I chose to do something equivalent to cloning and parallel processing. Uh, I didn't have time to hire four managers and then have those four managers go out and find people, so I just did the most expedient thing. I found four people, four victims who wanted to try management, and I asked them to step in and take these things on. Now, some of them actually, they really wanted to do it, but, um, but they needed a lot of ramp up. They needed to learn how to recruit. They knew they had the technical expertise to run, the, run these domains that they'd never recruited before. They needed to be ramped up. We worked very closely as a team to try to figure out how to accelerate uh, the growth of the team. And by 2012, we actually were pretty successful. We had staffed just ahead of the curve to be able to keep up with the demand uh, on all of those fronts. Within two years, we had completed our cloud migration for all the services owned, all those endpoints for doing streaming using all of the, the different legacy devices. We launched in three different regions, Canada, Latin America, and the UK. There was a massive explosion in devices, including one year in 2010 where we did a whole bunch of different gaming platforms, then downloadable versions of it, and then, by the way, iPad, iPhone, Apple TV, all at the same time, pretty much, all within, all sequential. That we did major product improvements. We did finally build that alternate audience subtitles feature set, and they, we kept building on that. And here's the agility piece. We had staffed up enough that when Netflix decided to take the CDN in-house, initially, the CDNs were external. They were third-party CDNs. There were multiples of them uh, that were actually performing the streaming for us. We decided to bring it in-house, and we had enough resources and leadership in place that we could quickly pivot and provide a cloud, res cloud service resource to the CDN team so that they could integrate with the Netflix infrastructure. So I think that was a fairly successful effort. And now I want to just take a minute uh, to talk about this, what I call IQ versus EQ. And this is the acknowledgement that people are not computers, that these analogies only go so far when you're thinking about applying computer science to organizational challenges. And in order to be successful doing this, you kind of need to be able to pivot between two states of mind. One I would call IQ, which is task-oriented, logical, literal, detached, impartial, and somewhat autocratic. If, there, if you can logically just think your way into the right solution and you can just go, boom, I know what the right answer is, let's just do that. Now on the EQ side, things get a little more squishy. It's feeling-oriented, it's emotional. It's social and political sometimes. It's empathetic. You think about how things affect people. And it's a bit more democratic, or you can even go as far as consensus-oriented. Now, you need to, one of the interesting things to think about is, when you're thinking about organizations, depending on where you are in the process of figuring things out, you can really go wrong by skewing too hard one way or the other. If you're too autocratic, and you simply make a decision and you leave people out of a decision-making process, you can alienate them, you can lose staff, you can make bad decisions about how people you know, will feel about certain changes. But if you're too EQ-oriented, you can get paralyzed by worrying about what everybody thinks about the decision you're gonna make. 
And so you have to really figure out where you're gonna make, strike the right balance. So if you wanna overcome tribalism, if you wanna get beyond us and them, you need to be able to move back and forth between these two modes. For IQ, you want to, when you're designing something, you really want to just purely think about it from an IQ perspective. What's the right solution? What are the options that we have? It's a very rational and logical exercise, and so is evaluation. If you're going to go and assess, is this the right design? Should we consider other ones? And implementation is also a rather dispassionate thing, at least it should be. I know sometimes people get very passionate about every aspect of engineering. But on the EQ side, there's two things that you really want to emphasize and think about whether you're gonna do a re-architecture or a re-architecture and then reorganize around that, is that the inception has to be planned and there needs to be trust. You need to plan, you need, people need to be in the loop. They need to be signed up for doing the work that you want them to do. If there's gonna be an implied architectural change that spans teams, all of those teams need to be on board for the most part. And then when you socialize things, you also wanna make sure you're being careful. So once you've made a decision and you decide you're gonna go ahead and roll that out, you wanna do things like, well, I'm doing this organizational change. We should probably tell the people who are most affected by it first so they don't find out from somebody else. And then of course you wanna go tell other folks what's going on so that they know who to go to uh, now that your organizational structure might have changed. And I would argue that what happened in the earliest story when I first kicked this off was a flawed inception. The decision was top down. There was no partnership between the parties. There was not a lot of trust between those parties that had been built up at the beginning. And I believe that that's what fostered a lot of that resentment and anger that came about, that lack of understanding of like, well, I don't think this is the right decision. And so now I'm gonna take us full circle. I'm gonna forward, fast forward to, to 2012. And this architecture that we had now lived with for several years this split between content discovery and then playback functionality had become something more like this. We'd moved to the cloud. We had this soup of microservices to call into. We had a new proxy service called Zool that did dynamic routing, but we still had NCCP and we still had API. And we had some weird things going on now where API was calling NCCP and other, the other way around. And we had these two edge services now tangled up in almost these sort of circular dependencies. And the wall was still there. There was growing complexity as a result, a duplication of effort, which we noticed was kind of really inefficient. And there was a tax on those engineers who had to work with both teams. Imagine you're the device person trying to write code and you've got different protocols and different team styles and security mechanisms that you're wrestling with. The work is almost double for the device engineers. And then Anthony Park raised the stakes, same gentleman from the first story. And he's, he had this obsession with playback in half a second. He was talking about it all the time. He said, we're gonna do this, we're gonna go figure this out. But the problem was in order to implement that, you needed to be able to integrate with both of the edge services in a really clean way. You needed to fetch lists of movies and you needed to, be also, you needed to also get limited duration licenses so that as soon as somebody clicked on play, you already had a DRM license. You were all ready to just start streaming right off the bat. And by the way, I checked with my boss at the time and he's like, yep, we're gonna do a lot more of that. So you should be ready for that. And in addition, as always, Netflix wanted to move faster and they were noticing some friction because of these two services and our reliability could have been better. We had two edge services and if either one of them was down, everything was down. You either couldn't find the content to play or you could find the content, you hit play and then it didn't work. So this is kind of an un unacceptable situation. So as a reminder, when do we refactor? Common tasks are difficult, well, we were there. And now we wanted to do this really hard stuff, these strategic things that were gonna make the customer experience so much better. And they were almost impractical to the point where they were almost impossible. This was Conway's revenge for me. If you have four teams working on a compiler, you'll end up with a four pass compiler. Well, we had two teams and a two edge service architecture. The exact same thing. This is Conway's law to a T. But fortunately, we had a better foundation this time. A gentleman named Daniel Jacobson came on board in 2010 and started working on really fixing a lot of the challenges with the Netflix API team. 
The team became more mature and had some rock star engineers on it now. The platform had gotten a lot better. It was much more robust. In fact, some folks on my team were going, we kind of want some of that. They've got some great technology over there. They were using Hystrix, for example. Some of you may be familiar with that. That's the team that created Hystrix. They had a strong operational focus, and so they were keeping their service up more and more. And the most important thing, Daniel and I had become friends. And we had spent a lot of time talking to each other about, gee, we've got these two edge service teams, and shouldn't we be working more closely together? Let's try and figure out how we can make that happen, because it seemed like something just wasn't right. And so there was a moment of truth. I was sitting down having a one-on-one -on -one with uh, our, a senior architect on my team, a gentleman named Peter Stout. And I just asked them this question. I said, Peter, OK, we've got these challenges. This is what's going on. We know there's pain. We know we need to fix this. What's the right solution? And Peter, being the very astute engineer and general smart guy that he is, do you care about the organizational implications? That was his very first question. It didn't, he didn't even hesitate. He didn't miss a beat. He knew about Conway's Law. He knew I might have some feelings about that. And I did. I was like, hmm, let me think about that for a minute. I had to pause. What's the implication for me? My team might get restructured. I, hadn't, I might lose control of the situation because I'm, I might open up this can of worms and I don't know where it's going to go. And I'm proud to say I had a moment of sanity. And I said, no, we'll figure that out later. There was enough trust in the people involved that I knew that the right thing would happen. And so what came out of that was a project called Blade Runner um, because it was the merging of the edge services. And this architecture became this. NCCP as playback became a, a, a set of middle tier services fronted by the Netflix API and the necessary functionality to do things like protocol, security, dynamic routing, the ability to decrypt tokens so that we could do dynamic routing, was integrated into the appropriate services. So this was a unified architecture uh, that came from common thinking across both teams. And the organizational structure reflected it. I trusted Daniel so much that I gave him my team. I said, you know what? This needs one leader, not two. We need to get this under unified leadership. And the playback services team, which is the renamed uh, version of streaming infrastructure, was directly integrated into this new organization called Edge Services. We gained some efficiency right away because some of those overlapping duplication of effort kinds of things could get consolidated. There could be one team focusing on insight and tools, not two. And that platform that the API had created and some of the good stuff that came out of the streaming infrastructure team could be shared across the two. And now that they're in a single organization, there were less excuses not to do that. And we roughly organized around the technology, not the other way around. We were organized around microservices. You see teams grouped around things like Zool and NCCP, uh, around functionality and those shared services. So takeaways uh, from all of this. Put your architecture first. Leverage those technical analogs so that you can take a step back and be dispassionate. Gain the ability to think like a computer when appropriate, but obviously you also need to be able to switch back and forth and know when to be sensitive to the social aspects of things. And if nothing else, be selfless because think about what's best for your company and try to break through those inter-team barriers that always happen between organizations. If you would like to reach out to me or follow me, here's my handle on Twitter, at Ops Engineering, and also my information on LinkedIn. And I'm not sure about time. Are we doing on time? We're technically out of time, but let's yeah. take time for one or two questions, if you have them. This mic might, might yes. not be on, but it's fun to hold on to. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, you know, since this is to kind of band together and just kind of jump on that, mm -hmm. um, I think we're on now. Maybe take a little bit different uh, maybe not Absolutely. Uh, 
Uh, it becomes difficult, and that's why I spent time talking about culture, because my ability to do those things and the ability for every other manager at Netflix to do those things is because they had so much freedom uh, to act based on you know, their best intentions for the business. In a more top-down and structured organization, you're going to have to adapt uh, in some way. Um, and if you find that you want to create sort of a free and responsible engineering culture, but your company doesn't support that at sort of the company culture level, you're probably going to clash. And so one, you'd either need to try to isolate yourself from the rest of that or try to influence uh, the culture of your company, which can be pretty challenging. Uh, but it's at least worth no, uh, being aware of the impact of the culture on your, your ability to do that so you don't just beat your head against the wall and say, well, I keep wanting to do this and it's not working. Why isn't it working? Well, frequently it could be because the, the wrong people, you know, the incentives are wrong. The culture is wrong. The people who get hired and fired and promoted, uh, which ultimately defines your culture, um, doesn't support what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but I still think there's probably pieces of this that can be applied. You can still think about the solutions first. So you can still mentally break through those barriers. You can create partnerships with the other engineering leads in your team and hopefully, uh, or across your organization, and hopefully you can break through. If you can explain these constructs to them and say, look, you know, we're building the wrong thing because the organization is driving uh, the wrong decisions. Can we do an exercise where we just do it? Let's just do a thought exercise about what's the right architecture. If we didn't, weren't worried about organization, what would we do? And then you can worry about compromising from there. Then you can go and say, well, this team really still wants to own this service, so you compromise. So those are the kinds of things I think you could try. All right, let's yeah. take just one more question, and then yeah. if you want to ask Josh other questions, sure. buy him a free yeah. beer. Let's see, anyone? You're all very thirsty. Okay, I Go. get it. I get it. Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Thank you.